Want to uh, welcome everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us for this conversation today. Um, I'm Rob Hope. I, uh, I'm a staff member with the Rework the Bay team. Uh, Rework the Bay is an initiative that's hosted at the San Francisco Foundation. Um, we bring together leaders in philanthropy, uh, business, workforce development, post-secondary education, investing um, around a diverse and equitable Bay Area. Um, I have a, another Rework the Bay team member with us today, uh, Brianna Rogers, who will be um, helping with any sort of technical issues that may come up. So feel free to chat Brianna uh, directly um, <clears throat> and or just uh, throw a note in the chat and Brianna can can help you out. Um, so uh, so Rework the Bay, just a little bit about us quickly before we, we uh, hear from our panelists. Um, Rework the Bay, uh, our strategy is really to uh, bring together folks who um, have shared values and vision for a diverse and equitable Bay Area, uh, but who have different uh, philosophies about the best way to accomplish those goals. Um, and uh, one of the uh, most concrete ways that we advance that strategy is through a group we call our Equity at Work Council, uh, which is currently a uh, uh, 14 individuals who uh, represent worker organizing, workforce development, impact investing, small business advocacy, post-secondary education. Um, and uh, we really uh, position them to uh, learn from and build relationships with each other while also informing our strategy. Um, and so just really excited to, uh, to have this conversation today. Um, hopefully you'll get a taste of some of the value of, of uh, cross-sector collaboration here. Um, so <clears throat> we wanted to start by just inviting each of the panelists to do a, a brief introduction of uh, you and your organization. And also um, because the topic of today is about sort of how work is changing and coming out of the pandemic, hopefully, um, would love each of you to share one thing about your life that's changed during the pandemic related to work that you plan to continue um, by choice uh, as, as we move out of the pandemic. Um, so uh, why don't we start with uh, Kung? Hey, all. Um, so just a personal introduction. I've spent about 20 years in the labor movement um, doing different forms of work, working in a restaurant, working in construction, manufacturing. Um, and then I moved on to be a union organizer. And for the last 10 years, I've been at Jobs with Justice San Francisco. Um, J with J, as we call it, is a labor community coalition. Uh, we're also affiliated with a national network and you'll hear from the national Jobs with Justice ED, Erica Smiley later today. Um, and we're also our own organization here in San Francisco. Uh, we're made up of unions, worker centers, community groups, and our members range from you know, domestic workers, service workers, educators, city workers, um, and also tenants, um, seniors, people with disabilities, um, and parents. Um, just on a personal note, right, Jobs with Justice has been a home for me, right? Um, it's been a space where I've seen some of the favorite parts of the labor movement come together. Um, we're built around solidarity. We're built around collectivity, uh, around the idea of fighting for someone you don't know, and of building long-term relationships and building this sense of a bigger we. And, and our approach around building a bigger we is, is how we make big wins, right? So raising the minimum wage, creating free higher education at City College, uh, winning the country's first fair scheduling laws. Um, and we also work on the intersections of workers' rights, housing, and climate justice because you know, people don't lead single issue lives. And so we, have, we don't have single issue fights. Um, one thing that's changed about my work uh, is I spend more time outside. I, I love it. I go for a lot of walks with people. Um, I've been in my coworker's backyard and eaten passion fruit from the vines she's growing. I've been with a coworker playing peekaboo with her baby, um, you know, and I, I do miss a lot of connection with people during the pandemic as we all uh, do, but I've also deepened my connection with folks. So pass it back. Thanks, Kong. Um, we'll continue on with Zima. Good morning, friends. So happy to be here. I'm Zima Creason. I'm the executive director of the California Edge Coalition. I'm also the vice president of the San Juan Unified Board of Education. We're the 10th or 11th largest school district in California. 
EDGE is a statewide policy and advocacy organization. We focus on addressing workforce shortages while creating pathways to the middle class with a real eye on economic mobility for Californians that have been historically left out of our state's prosperity for ever. Uh, at EDGE, we focus on adult learners. Most recently, we expanded our scope to include opportunity youth. So opportunity youth, also called OY, are individuals between 16 and 24 that aren't in school, they're not working. Um, they, it includes young folks that may be involved in foster care, juvenile justice, or homelessness systems of care. So what makes EDGE really unique is the composition of our coalition, of our coalition membership. So we unite business, labor, social justice, education, and workforce development organizations to advance our mission. So these are groups that sometimes have very different interests. Um, we have a joke at our office that if we could come to consensus at our board table, we have no trouble at the Capitol because we've worked it all out for them. So um, what one thing that has changed over the pandemic that I wanna move forward in our office is um, working from home. So we were always already set up to work from home. We were spending most Fridays working remotely. Um, obviously when the shutdown happened, we shut down and it was hundred percent working from home. And we made the decision that we're never going to go back, um, to mostly being in the office. We found that we can completely get the work done from home, that it's working better for staff for a variety of reasons. I mean, when we think about the travel time, um, just getting up and getting ready in the morning, um, just the flexibility that comes, uh, comes with being able to open the door when someone's going to come work on something in your house and not have to stress out about what you're going to do uh, while you're away, you know, 30, 45 minutes away from your home. Um, so we're going to continue. We actually got rid of our standard, our, uh, our office space, moved into a shared workspace, got a uh, dedicated suite in there. We've implemented what we call togetherness Mondays. So we spend about a half day together because we do like having that connection time. We do our staff meeting, celebrate um, birthdays, uh, whatever it may be. Um, but we are going to mostly work remotely. I'll also add, and then I'll stop and pass it on. Um, we are going to ensure that there is workspace available to staff that want to use it. Because sometimes people just need to get away from their cat. And so we want to make sure that we're accommodate, accommodating that as well. So there is space for folks to use if they want it, whenever they want it. Awesome. Thank you, Zima. Um, and I also encourage uh, attendees, if you want to add something in the chat, uh, an intro of yourself and your organization, or and or if there's something that you've uh, picked up over the past couple of years in your uh, work practices that you'll continue. We'd love to hear that too. Um, let's go to Keitan next. Thanks, Rob. Um, morning, everyone. I'm, I'm Keitan Williams. I help manage a social impact investment firm called Impact of America Fund, which we'll talk about in a minute. But as a form of bio, I, I'll say that I feel like I'm an immigrant twice over. I came to the US to study engineering and that turned into a long career in the Valley building internet services when they went from, I think something that was very nascent to something that we now feel are very necessary. And then I'm, I feel like an immigrant to the internet. I got online as a teenager when I was in Jamaica and then it shaped not just my career, but my larger life. I think it's given me the access and knowledge to sort of relocate and transform in ways that I hadn't anticipated. And that's what I found excited about, exciting about being a technologist, but it's also why I left the field. I'm fascinated by digital network technology, fascinated by what we can do now with our phones, whether we're on the go or on the toilet in the morning. Um, but I also realized that I'm more interested in the people building and using the technology than I am in the things themselves. So the who and the why is what's driving my interest rather than the what and the how. And that's why I ended up moving from engineering to research and then into impact investing. Our, our goal at Impact America Fund is to invest in companies that can disrupt injustices in what we think are large, meaningful industries that can increase the economic power of workers, families, and small businesses in communities that have been historically marginalized and overlooked. So far, that's looked like investing in companies that help small business access capital on better terms or provide people with alternatives to payday lending or help build and build credit or lower their debt or companies that improve wages or training or power for workers in childcare or home care or parts of the gig economy. And then you know, one thing that has changed about my work life, I think is that I've become more accepting of things, you know, falling apart or being imperfect. I feel like um, 
I was at least trying to beat capitalism by working harder or more unsustainably. And that, I think that's really the trap, right? That's the trap of capitalism. Um, but, you know, I, I turned 40 a few months before the pandemic. So I think that's twisted the typical midlife crisis I'm supposed to go through. I'll head it back to Europe. Thanks, Keitan. Um, and uh, we'll uh, round it out with Lisa. Thanks, Rob. Good morning, everyone. My name is Lisa Countryman Kuros. I'm the CEO of Jewish Vocational Service. And at JVS, we create pathways to prosperity with a focus on racial equity and economic mobility through both direct service and systems change work. So our work is really built on three pillars. First, we're creating transformative training and employment programs um, in sectors with high quality jobs like healthcare, like technology, um, like the trades. And overall, we're seeing a 91% increase in our job seekers earnings post program. We also work directly with employers to transform their hiring and onboarding practices in order to open up more opportunities for more diverse talent. And the third piece is that we affect systems change through policy and advocacy work, focusing on reducing barriers to prosperity and mobility and advocating for investments that are the most effective to support job seekers. The thing that has changed the most in my work life post during the pandemic and will continue on beyond to the endemic, I guess. Um, what Keitan said really resonated with me. I think that I used to be much more kind of task oriented and achievement oriented and, you know, kind of um, centered in volume. Like there are all these things that I have to get done. I'm deep in the nonprofit scarcity world. Um, and I really shifted to focusing on what is my highest intention focusing on bringing really the right mindset to every situation um, and focusing on my relationships, you know, personal and professional for the, for the long term. So I'm really excited to be with all of you today. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Lisa. Um, so as you all see, we have a, an incredible panel here. Um, it was difficult to, to select questions to ask because I, I could talk to these folks all afternoon. Um, but I'm going to uh, come back to you, Lisa, to start. Um, so there's a lot of conversation right now in uh, the sort of public discourse around this phenomenon that's often referred to as the great resignation. Um, and, you know, your organization is working with folks on the ground looking for work every day. And so would love to just kind of hear what you make of this phenomenon that we often call the great resignation. Thank you. I am very frustrated by this narrative. Um, I, I found it frustrating even before I, I kind of um, dug a little bit deeper into it. Uh, the thing that I find most frustrating is that it really turns a blind eye to the millions of people who do not have the kind of choices that are being alluded to in that conversation. So I think we have to um, we have to parse out that there are there are the facts. There's the story that we make up about the facts, and then there's the piece that's just unspoken. Um, and in this case, the facts are, yes, millions of uh, Americans quit their jobs during um, 2021. I think 24 million people between uh, April and September of 2021 quit their jobs. Um, so that's true. The story, the interpretation about that is that people just don't want to work anymore, that people are living lives of sort of stimulus check fueled leisure and they're they're making sourdough and they're living in a cabin in Tahoe and it's just it's it's insulting to the millions of people millions of Californians in fact um, who are struggling to get by who have continued to show up for work um, at their job site throughout the pandemic putting their lives at risk potentially putting the lives of family members and loved ones at risk um, currently 25% of working people in California are living in poverty. That's over 4 million people. So these people are just being completely ignored through this narrative. Um, and I do want to dig into a couple of pieces um, about kind of the facts of that. Um, so the facts are true. You know, the story is much more complicated. Um, there have been two really great reports that have come out recently that I think get at, at kind of two different sides of this. One from the San Francisco Fed, um, which really illustrates that this is not this is not a completely unprecedented phenomenon. In fact, 
in any era of a fast recovery and, and sort of surge in jobs, there is this kind of churn that happens and it happens within kind of a layer of people who do have some options and have leverage to kind of upgrade their position. But it is not a situation that's life-changing for low-income people, um, which has been a narrative that's been spun. The other side of this was a great analysis, and I, I think my colleagues are um, putting these links into the chat, an analysis from um, MIT Sloan Review, which highlights that um, even if you look across sectors, um, you see that the by far the most dominant reason that people quit their jobs during the recession has been toxic workplace culture. And this is true across sectors. So I think that really the story here is there are some folks with choices. Those folks are leaving their jobs and they're voting kind of against this toxic hustle culture that Peyton was referring to. But on the other hand, we have a whole host of people who simply do not have access to those kinds of choices. And so I'm dedicated to lifting up that reality and really working hard to pull together folks from across sectors uh, to, to, ch to change the options that people have and to create real access to mobility. Thanks so much, Lisa. Um, and those, I definitely encourage folks to check out those pieces. They're, um, they're really uh, provide insights. Um, it's really helpful for me to understand what's going on. And uh, Kung, I wanna go to you with the same question as well as somebody who is also um, engaging with hearing from uh, workers on the ground and, and have been over the past couple of years. What, what do you make of this phenomenon? Yeah, um, I totally am on the same page with Lisa, right? And to share some of those stories, you know, it's the tale of, of two pandemics, right? You have people who are able to work from home or, you know, go work from Tahoe, um, and then, you know, the people that we saw in UndocuFund lost all their income, you know, don't have a safety net. We're going into tens of thousands of dollars in rent debt, right? Or you have people who continue to go to work, right? Um, there were workers at a McDonald's in the East Bay who went on strike and the owner gave them dog diapers so that they can make masks themselves. And they experienced a COVID outbreak where 30 people, including their families, uh, had COVID, right? So people are experiencing the pandemic really differently and experiencing this current phase very differently. Class, race, gender, immigration status, and where people work are mattering. They can't, they matter before the pandemic and this continues. Um, about half of hotel workers in San Francisco are still not back to work full time, half. Um, and these corporate hotels are actually using this moment to cut back on staffing. So you have a hotel that's like at 80% occupancy, but only bringing back 55% of their housekeepers. Um, they're using this opportunity to sort of lock in lower labor costs. Um, similar thing happening when I talk to people who are working at the airport. There's some service workers who are contracted out and do work for United Airlines. And there's people here who have worked this, this job for decades. Right. They took a hit in the income when travel was down um, all the while, you know, governments were bailing out airlines. Right. And now they come back and they're being told that they can only have 20 hours a week. Right. Some worker center organizers here in San Francisco, you know, they work with immigrant workers. They haven't really seen their members go out and, you know, get better jobs. And I don't know why that might be, but maybe it's because workers are already working in a situation where they don't make minimum wage even right, much less go out and get those raises. So I have seen those studies that say that there's a lift for low wage workers, that there's churn in certain industries like hospitality. And I do see right there's opportunity in that. But I think my biggest question, right, like we have to ask more questions about that. And it's like, are people able to quit and find a better job and navigate that as an individual? Or are we meaningfully changing those jobs for the long term? Are we making structural change, right? Are people building power at the job that they hold, right? And they can continue to hold that and continue to exercise that power at their job, right? So that they can, in the future, continue to raise wages. Awesome, thank you so much, Kung. Um, and, uh, you know, one of the, um, so Rework the Bay's three-part framework focuses on increasing the number of quality jobs that exist in our region, um, increasing equitable access to those jobs, and increasing the availability of the supports we all need to be successful at work, like 
child care and transportation and housing. Um, and, um, and so getting at that question around access. Um, so we uh, Rework the Bay recently launched a new data tool that our Equity at Work Council helped develop called the State of Bay Area Workers. Um, and maybe Brianna, you could throw the link to that in the chat. Um, and uh, one of the insights that um, I got from looking at that data um, is how uh, people of color are clustered in uh, low income jobs in the Bay Area. Uh, for example, um, Latinx people make up 23% uh, of Bay Area workers overall, uh, but over 40% of food preparation and service workers. Um, and so this question is for the whole panel, whoever wants to jump in. Why do you think people of color continue to be overrepresented in low paying jobs, even as the Bay Area creates uh, more high paid jobs? Um, and then also, do you have um, strategies that you're using in your respective fields to uh, try to close those gaps? Anybody want to take that one on? All right, go for it, Lisa. Great. <clears throat> so I think that, you know, from, from my perspective, from a workforce development centered perspective, um, this is all about job quality and access to mobility. So since the 1970s, employers have decreased the amount of time they invest in worker training by 90%. So if there is low job quality in the sense of unpredictable hours, um, you know, no control over your own schedule, there's really no potential to engage in training that would allow you to advance. Um, and so I think there needs to be a complete rethinking among employers around job quality and investing in worker training. Um, I think that the good news for employers is that it is possible to partner with organizations um, you know, in the workforce field that can provide that training, that advancement support. Um, we are doing this. So in the, in the dental field, um, we are creating advancement pathways for dental assistants into registered dental assistant. And then in the future, there's additional training that we want to pursue um, that would allow people to approach, you know, to ex grow basically from $20, $21 an hour to about $35 an hour. Um, and I think there are versions of that that you can apply to a whole, to any sector, really. Um, so the investment and advancement um, from a workforce perspective would be my response. Thanks, Lisa. Yeah, Zima. Yeah, I agree with everything Lisa had just said. And I'll say, you know, there's, from my perspective, there are a lot of variables that contribute to this. Um, I think one that I'll highlight is how expensive education and training is in general. Even with, you know, Tikas released a report a couple of years ago that demonstrated that even in California with free community colleges, community college could actually end up being more expensive than going to a four year college when you factor in time off work, childcare, transportation materials, um, access, you know, to, te to tech. So getting that laptop, it, accessing the internet. Um, there's a lot of cost that comes with be being educated. And EDGE, um, I'm not sure if I mentioned it at the beginning of our talk, but we focus on adult learners. So uh, these are a lot of folks that already have a family, already are in a job, often a low wage job, but that's still the money coming into their family. So they have to stop that to be able to focus on uh, completing their education and training goals. And people can't afford to do that. So then they remain stagnant. So again, you know, in the interest of time, I think I'll leave it at that. But there's so many factors that contribute to this. There's a lot of factors that contribute to why just access, accessing education and training is challenging, including racism, which is um, a big piece of the pie of why people are kept at a floor level and don't have that access to upward mobility. Thank you, Zima. Um, and Ketan or, or Kong, either one of you want to weigh on, in on this question? You know, we're, it, it's tough. I think we're deep in the, the in the servant economy, which the human is sort of like touched on. And it's hard for people to go back once you've got accustomed to things like higher convenience and the relatively low cost of things that deliver in a few hours. And someone has to bear the brunt of that, right? Um, it's it's venture capital sometimes that sub subsidizes that makes makes it hard for non-venture platforms to compete and then the price goes down across the board workers are forced to subsidize that with their labor and their bodies um 
you know, we're, we're trying to invest in uplift platforms that pay workers properly, recognize their value, and then invest in their training because in large part, I think they recognize that that training then increases the value of the products and services they provide. But again, we're in this competitive market where it feels like everybody's like racing to the bottom and trying to compete in a very unsustainable way without a, like a holistic view on how it all pays together. Yeah, I think those are all good points. So to make it quick, I, I know a, a term that's been floating around is occupational segregation, you know, and I think that gets to some of the structural racism. Um, but also like nobody should be overrepresented, in, you know, in a low wage job, we should just not pay people low wages, you know, and to do that, you know, we need folks to be able to step up and push for what they need. Um, so I'm a believer in workers organizing at the job. Yeah, Kang, I appreciate that comment. And, um, you know, to add a reflection, uh, one of the things that uh, was a, a insight for me as I stepped out of my career in community-based workforce development and was able to see it from a little bit more distance is that there's this implicit um, assumption that um, the idea is to move people out of bad jobs into good jobs and um, which is great for that individual person, but that um, that assumption is based on the idea that there are going to always be people who are in bad jobs. And um, as we're seeing in the Bay Area, the number of people in those bad jobs is growing. And so um, it feels continues to feel important to um, help people move out of those um, jobs. But we also um, there aren't enough good jobs for everybody to have one. And so we need to. Uh, we need to improve the quality of the jobs that folks are in already. Um, and uh, Kang, I'm going to come back to you uh, for this one. Um, and it's along a, a similar line of thinking. So we have also seen a lot of nationwide headlines about big organizing wins, especially at corporations. I just saw that the flagship Starbucks store in Seattle um, just uh, voted to unionize. Um, and so, you know, you're you're in in the thick of uh, worker organizing in the Bay Area. Um, what do you make of this uh, this kind of resurgence in uh, worker organizing that we've seen over the past year? All right, you're talking my language, Rob. This is uh, what excites me, and I do feel like there is an excitement and interest in in labor organizing and union organizing in particular. Um, I feel that with some of the young people I, I talk to, um, the average age of the Amazon labor union organizers that you read about in Staten Island is like 26 years old, right? And I also feel like another grouping of folks is progressives and we, we need that, right? People in our movement who are doing this work who are also talking more about class and work and about unions. Um, and I would say that, and I also add some complexity, which is like, you know, a lot of working people, you know, some of the workers at the airport that we talked about earlier, um, may actually not have heard about what's happening at Starbucks at, at Amazon. And overall, like unionization is still declining to, to you know, about 10%. Um, so there's a lot of people who aren't connected to unions in the same way that they were before. Um, and that means because it's it's because opposition to unions is, is still pretty tough. This didn't just happen, right? We're part of a coalition called California Coalition for Worker Power. And we have a campaign around workers who face retaliation in the workplace. Um, about half of workers in California, you know, when they're filing those wage claims or whatever, they, they face retaliation, right? Um, it's deeply prevalent. And I would say the overall like playing field is, is stacked against us. Like labor laws are not favorable. Right. We have a political system that is, you know, dominated by people who have wealth. Right. And our overall thinking as a society is really focused on individual meritocracy. Right. And that sort of goes against this idea that we should come together and do better collectively. Um, so I'm an organizing nerd. Um, there is a model of organizing uh, that's sort of called momentum based organizing and some of what's contained in that. Um, seems very applicable to what's happening at Starbucks, right? There's, there is a surge. Organizers are, are kind of leaning into that and riding that. Um, but there's also this other form of organizing that we call structure-based organizing. And I think why well, I use that because organizing takes time. It takes a lot of intention. It takes a lot of one-on-one -on -one conversation. And it takes structure. 
So when you're unionizing, it's like, are you talking to people in every department on every shift? Are you developing and finding leaders who are the ones talking to their coworkers in every department, every shift, every kind of social group, every ethnicity or every immigrant community? And that's what happened in the Amazon victory, right? So there's Amazon organizers like Angelique Maldonado, and they were talking to their coworkers and dividing shifts with their fellow organizers to cover the warehouse 24 hours, seven days a week. And then on their off days, they're like running these phone banks from a union headquarters and calling through the list of their coworkers, right? And these workers still have to win a contract in the future. So this is not over, right? This is a victory, but that's the road ahead is actually going to be hard. And the question is, is there still going to be that kind of me media attention or our attention on it, right? Um, and so this day in, day out, like organizing, right? It's the grind. It's sort of the unseen work. You know, you have worker centers here in San Francisco, Chinese Progressive Association, Trabadores, Unidos, you know, doing that day in, day out, like structure-based organizing. And one of the biggest reunion uh, victories that was in the last couple of years was 40,000 childcare workers who want a union in California. And that fight actually took 17 years. So what I'm highlighting here is that there can be surges and we leap forward and that the work of organizing takes a lot of patience and it takes being in it for the long haul. Thank you, Kang. And uh, does anybody else wanna weigh in on this question? Um, I will uh, vouch for the fact that Kung is an organizing nerd. Um, and I mean that as the best possible compliment because I have learned so much from you, Kung, um, in my time knowing you about how organizing works. And so I'm really grateful for that. Um, and, you know, one thing I, I have heard you say, I think today, but also in the past, is just how um, organizers really think about the whole person. So they think about, um, not just what people need at work, but uh, what people's families need. Um, you know, we've talked about the importance of affordable housing to workers. Um, and Zima, that's something that I've heard you talk about too, this idea that um, too often our workforce system doesn't see the whole person. And so I'd love to hear you share more about how um, you and your team at the EDGE Coalition think about this idea of a whole person approach. Yeah, you know, Rob and I are in the same room quite often, and this is something, one of my broken record um, remarks is, you know, we have to look at the whole person um, every step of the way or none of this is going to come together. So, you know, as I mentioned before, EDGE does focus on education and training so folks can access and have the skills that they need to access um, good jobs, family supporting wages and the benefits. But really, people can't focus on education and training if they're hungry, if they can't make rent, if there's nobody to watch their kids and they have no way to get there. <laughs> like none of that can happen without these ground level supports. Um, so EDGE has made it a policy priority. We go through a process every year, we define our annual policy priorities. And that has been a priority for us is that, you know, people have their basic needs met. So they really can take this next step and meet their education and ultimately employment goals. There's a variety of opportunity right now um, through legislative initiatives as well as budget initiatives in the California legislature right now to do just this, to do uh, better serve and meet the needs of individuals, their basic needs. However, something that con uh, concerns me quite a bit, you know, there's been a whole lot of investment in this space um, as a result of COVID, right? Response and recovery efforts. But a lot of these are one-time funds. And so I have a deep fear about what's going to happen when these dollars run out and that investment's gone. Because we know that this need existed prior to the pandemic. Yes, it got much worse because of the pandemic, absolutely. But a lot of a lot of this need was already there. So once these one funds, uh, one time funds are gone, and we rip rip them away, are we going to leave communities worse off than where they started? Um, so Edge is working really hard. You know, we're a policy and advocacy organization. We're working really, really hard with our partners to ensure that folks can have the services and supports that they need long term to meet their goals. Thanks, Zima. Um, Lisa, do you want to weigh in, the, in on this one? Yeah, I just want to reinforce what Zima said, that we see on the ground how completely transformative and necessary and critical it is to provide additional, you know, you can call them wraparound supports. I think that the way that the government defines that is actually extremely limited. And what we provide is much more robust and comprehensive than that. 
uh, that was a really positive development actually of the pandemic in the spring of 2021 we were able to raise an additional million dollars in order to provide emergency supports and really just to do whatever we needed to um, responsive to unprecedented change. And we've, we have kept that as part of our model um, that we provide emergency cash support to clients. And we, you know, are gathering now a body of evidence that, you know, we hope we can use in policy and advocacy uh, to just reinforce how even small seeming amounts, you know, our average, um, our average uh, cash support payment is about $127. Um, and we can actually track all the different ways that can be incredibly meaningful um, in terms of keeping someone housed, keeping their family fed, um, ensuring that they can travel to and from their work site or their training site. So, um, you know, we've seen wins with this. Uh, the breaking barriers to employment funding has been critical. We have to maintain that. Um, and I think that, you know, collectively as part of a larger system, we have to understand what it really takes um, to help people make these big transitions. And the workforce system, the public workforce system has really undercut the amount of investment that's needed. So um, I think we always have to be fighting for more. Well, I a final thought. Lisa, you made me think about something that I just wanted to add. You know, my previous comment, comments were really specific to education and training, but just thinking about in the workplace for just a moment. Turnover is really, really expensive. It really is very expensive for employers. So there really isn't a return on investment for taking a beat, just taking a moment. And are you okay, employee? You know, because if somebody just needs a little help with something, you know, um, that could save the organization. I mean, first of all, it's the right thing to do. You know, I, I come from the power to the people kind of side of the house. But if I put my just my straight business hat on, it will make you money to make sure that your employees are taken care of. You know, even if it's something just flexibility, you know, what if, you know, a pair uh, you have an employee that's a parent that is having an issue with transportation, getting their kid to school. Um, what if you let them change their lunch break, you know, or picking up their kid from school? Maybe they change their lunch break so they can take their hour to get their kid. It's a different time of day. It's maybe three o'clock, not noon. Is it really going to hurt your organization? Probably not. Um, you know, it's the little things like that that really can make a world of difference to uh, your staff. And that will shake out in the ROI in the long run. It's much better than someone having to leave their job or being completely stressed out and miserable because they can't meet their home needs. So it's worth taking that beat and having those conversations and implementing reasonable accommodations um, that make sense. Thanks, Zima. Um, yeah, so you know, I mentioned with Rework the Bay, one of our three pillars is um, access to affordable supports that we all need to be successful at work. And we oftentimes refer to that as our the rest of life bucket, um, which pretty much is all encompassing outside of work. And um, you know, one observation around that is that uh, is just it's become so clear how uh, we center work in our lives as a culture in America, and that um, so much of the efforts that focus on uh, helping families thrive um, really focus on that one part of life, the work part, um, and pay short shrift to the rest of life, which I think, you know, one of my observations personally through the pandemic is um, just all of the other aspects of my life that are really important to me, and that uh, benefit from uh, uh, direct attention, increased, I'm trying to say, say this in a way that uh, doesn't make me uh, sound like a, a negligent uh, family member or anything. But um, yeah, that, that, you know, it's amazing what can happen when you take some time, uh, some brain space, some emotional space to focus on things other than work. Um, and, um, and so, um, Katen, I want to come back to you. Um, you're definitely your your career trajectory is uh, one of the more fascinating for me, and that I've also learned a lot from you as well in our many conversations. Um, you know, you you started out um, in the uh, sort of tech sector as a implementer, as a leader. Um, you're now in the um, impact investing space, focused on focused on tech driven solutions. And I'm just curious, you know, what do you see as the connection between tech investing and the ability of workers to thrive? 
Thanks, Rob. Um, yeah, I, I think it goes back to um, what I try to touch on in the beginning, which is the the why and that who over the what. You know, the the people and our vision for what we want our society to be in that holistic way that Zima spoke to. You know, instead of that, is focus on the technological novelty, which tends to give get primary focus. I, you know, I think we're at a time. You know, certainly more than when I started in tech, where it feels like to get access to an economic opportunity that's increasingly governed by a tech platform in some way. And the vast majority of these platforms still aren't being built or funded or even managed in a way that addresses the systemic inequities that we're talking about here or centers the agency or energy or joy of low income communities of color in particular. You know, instead, we just see technology and capital sort of applied again and again in this ex extractive, exploitative pattern against workers and communities. So I think, you know, my fundamental measure for impactful tech investing is whether the least of us and the most systematically oppressed can thrive, you know, on and off or through these platforms. And I think that means that we need a greater diversity of services that center workers, you know, platforms that are built around their needs and the needs of our communities as a whole. And you know, I think that means investing towards a future where workers have decision-making power and ownership in these platforms, because these are the platforms that determine day-to-day -day economic engagement. You know, I, I think like stepping back, this isn't a particularly novel observation that I'm making here, but I, I think what we're talking about here today reflects like a deep form of optimism and hope you know, there's a lot of pushback in, in some mainstream tech investing circles that I used to be a part of and still kind of are a part of that, you know, criticism from those of us who care deeply about centering the marginalized or those who have been ill considered is pessimist, is pessimism. You know, we're cast as pessimists for pointing out flaws and harms to our communities. But, I, you know, I think we're actually deeply driven by optimism. And certainly, I, I think I am. I think we're imagining and putting into action, you know, changes to how our society has functioned for hundreds of years. You know, we're, we're challenging who and what is valued. And we're asking for, and I think we're pointing to a world in which platforms and technologies don't find their innovation, um, find their innovation, I should say, through uplifting and recentering rather than repeating these, these repetition, this repetition of time-worn patterns of extraction. So to me, you know, workers thriving is critical to, you know, a sustainable, joyful society. And that's what I want technologists and entrepreneurs to mean when they say that world changing innovation, we are changing the world. And at the end of the day, I don't expect all tech investing to be centered around that. But I think that's the norm. That is what it means to be optimistic, to have techno optimism, to be techno technologically solutionist oriented, um, not trying to get us to the moon again. Uh, one quick follow-up question for you, Keaton, and then um, if anyone else wants to weigh in on this one. Uh, I'm curious, could you walk us through maybe one investment that you've made that you're really excited about, just to kind of make it really concrete what it looks like to invest in a company um, that's advancing these very optimistic goals that you described? Yeah, we are invested in a company called uh, Care Academy that does um, uh, training and retention services for home here, home healthcare workers. And as we've touched on, this is an industry that's, you know, just rife with problems. Uh, there's a lot of like, um, I don't know, what, what kind of like solitude and difficulty on the job. But there is a huge problem at the top of the pipeline where, you know, there's a huge amounts of turnover because people aren't being trained and prepared for a very difficult job. And Care Academy focuses on certifications and training for these care workers who are mostly um, women of color, mostly low income, and providing them the sort of like portable certifications from a state by state perspective that allow them to move into higher paying jobs in this sector, de dementia training, for example. So, you know, this is like, okay, this is a scalable tech platform, but they're like, core measure of whether they're succeeding is, are they handing out certifications? As a result of these certifications, are these women getting better access to jobs? Are the agencies that employ them seeing less turnover to Zima's point, because that is actually a fundamental measure of the quality of your business. And then as a result, are patients, people in their home, because uh, in-home care is an increasing part of the sector. People want to age 
at home? Um, are they getting care that's more affordable but higher quality? So it's an example of investment that like tackles three parts of this problem um, in a unified way without having to do that much. Like as you pointed out, like training your workers and improving turnover is fundamentally good for everyone. Thanks, Kajan. That's really helpful. Um, anyone else want to weigh in on this one? I'll throw in something. Um, you know, a report that we did with you, Rework and Working Partnerships, um, I think speaks to what Kajan is saying, right? Where I think we're used to thinking of technology as inevitable, as something that happens to us, right? And so much of the work that Kajan is lifting up is about the other, is like the optimism, is that we can have agency and shape the future. And that is so vital, right? Um, another piece that pops into mind as an example of work that's happening, right? Like there's so much like surveillance that's happening. There's a lot of algorithmic bias that, you know, is just perpetuating structural racism, like both in terms of like, you know, sentencing of people, but also like how people are hired or tracked at work. And the important part is that there are people who are organizing at their workplace to push back on that. So there's a bill, um, it's called AB 1651, Workplace Technology Accountability Act, and it's creating rights for workers at their workplace around technology. So just wanted to offer another example. Thanks for that, Kong. And that's a, a great segue um, to our wrap up question, which I'll ask each of you to respond to. Um, so that uh, project that you just alluded to um, is um, there's also a fantastic report that Jobs with Justice and Working Partnerships put together called Power is at the Root uh, that summarizes their findings and their recommendations. Um, and uh, one of the key kind of narrative pieces that that project lifted up was this idea of talking about the future of workers rather than the future of work. And so I want to ask all of you. Um, what does an ideal future of workers look like to you? Um, and do you have one sort of concrete step or call to action for um, the folks with us today, um, how we can make that uh, future a reality? Anyone wanna go, wanna go first? All right, Zima, how did I know you were gonna raise your hand? I always give it a two breaths and then I jump in there. <laughs> Now, this has been a great conversation and thank you so much, Rob, uh, for moderating this. This has been great. Um, you know, to me, my dream is all jobs are good jobs. You know, that was said earlier in the uh, in the panel discussion. I would love for all jobs to be good jobs. And I think that we're in a really special place in history where we can actually move in that direction. Um, you know, where all humans receive the respect and dignity that they deserve, where we shift away from greed and run towards harmony uh, for our communities. That's what I want to believe our future is looking like. And that's why I work so hard. Um, I'm, like I said before, I'm a power to the people kind of person. And again, there's so much opportunity right now. And if just enough of us get involved and raise our voice collectively and do the work collectively, um, I think we can get there. So um, I would love to see more individuals and community-based organizations involved in state policy and advocacy work. A lot of change can happen at that level. There's so much money, so much investment, um, so much policy uh, making that's affecting the local level, but we don't have enough local level voice and expertise. Those That voice of lived experience or the organization so working close, most closely with the communities we're seeking to serve involved in statewide policy and advocacy. And so my hope and my call to action is that we have more of that at the table. Um, after I'm done speaking, I'm going to drop a link to the EDGE website in the chat. And through the website, you can say, sign up for our email list. You can link into our social media channels. We have lots of calls to action to be um, involved in our advocacy efforts. Um, and we provide technical assistance, scripts, sign-on letters. We try to make it very, very easy for people to engage and also uplift, you know, just the issues, what's going on. Because, you know, state policy can be a very scary place if you're not in it. It's not easy to just plug in and understand. But we're here for you to make it easier. And we have a wonderful team at EDGE that's always happy to jump on the phone and 
answer questions. Uh, this is your system. Um, this is your government. Even if we're sometimes led to believe it's not, it is. And we do have a whole lot of power, especially when we come together to move this work forward. Thanks, Zima. And I just want to um, testify that uh, the EDGE Coalition does an amazing job at uh, breaking down key policy questions. I don't there. I don't know how many uh, policy areas are more complicated than workforce development and uh, post secondary education, uh, but I know that I personally it's it's sometimes hard for me to stay engaged in those conversations because they're so jargon filled and complicated. And um, Zima's team does an incredible job of, of breaking that down and uh, making. Um, opportunities to get engaged uh, really easy. So thank you, Zima. Thanks, Rob. Um, well, let's go to Lisa next. Thanks, Rob. Mm -hmm. um, I think my ideal future is one in which everyone has access to prosperity and we see zero racial disparities in terms of earnings and success. Um, you know, I think this conversation was a great example of how they're there's no sort of one single thing that we can do. Um, we actually need to be working together kind of from each of these perspectives to ensure that all jobs are good jobs, to ensure that there is much more mobility, to ensure that um, you know, tech is being deployed in a way that does not kind of further perpetuate and deepen um, inequality. And I would also say that if I could boil it down to one thing, I think that there is a mindset shift that we all need to make that is rooted in the idea that if we are uh, creating workplaces that are more accessible and more supportive to people with different needs and coming from different backgrounds, that's good for everyone. Those two reports that I cited kind of talk about two different perspectives. One, people leaving because of toxic workplace culture, you know, and in the other case, really the reality of far, uh, far fewer people having access, there's actually a truth that's shared across those, which is that if we change our workplace culture, if we make these opportunities more accessible, it's better for everyone. So it's really a story of kind of lifting all boats. Thank you, Lisa. And, you know, um, JVS is, is one of um, not a lot of workforce organizations. There are others, but um, JVS is really remarkable and they're work to um, affect systems change in addition to providing really top-notch training to uh, job seekers. Um, and so I just, I, I it's a, it's an inspiration to me um, seeing those efforts um, that, that don't just uh, focus on helping people overcome barriers to employment, because that in and of itself is a huge job. Um, and so I just appreciate how JVS um, does that and um, also tries to impact the underlying uh, systemic issues that are getting in the way. So thank you, Lisa. Thank you. Uh, Kayton. Thanks, Rob. You know, I think, I think I've already touched a lot on what I think the future looks like, at least in terms of tech-driven investments. I, I will say that I feel like I hear a lot from my vantage point about the future of work, but I don't think my sector has really wrestled with how much of our idea of the future, even when we're well-intentioned, like many investors, I believe, are. Is actually that idea is actually guided and shaped by the desires and the default of like returns on capital rather than people and labor. So, you know, the step I'm personally taking is showing up here, right? And being in community with efforts like Rework the Bay and being guided by the people who are closest to the workers and their vision of the future, because it's that vision that I want to see come to reality and it's theirs to define. So, you know, if anything, my call to action is other investors should be in spaces like this too. Yes, thank you, Katen. Um And uh, Kung, let's wrap up with you. Yeah, um, I think it goes back to some of the premise of this panel, right? To start with where we are and this shift in the labor market that we're all sort of excited about, but also that there's fundamental things that haven't shifted, right? During this pandemic, billionaires are adding more billions to their wealth. Right. If you look at the minimum wage, you adjust it for inflation, it's lower than it was 50 years ago. And the returns, right, the share of the returns that go to the people who work versus people who own the capital is just dropping and dropping. Right. So this great awakening, you know, it's in the future and it will come 
if we together decide to do something to change that and to make those fundamental shifts, right? Um, in terms of like work, good work, I, I have sort of like three principles. Um, first, that work provides a collective return to the people who do that work, right? The second is that that, that work feeds a social purpose, right? And improves our society. You know, it provides childcare, it, you know, prevents climate change. Um, and also that work encourages democracy, right? That's fundamental to our society and work should be part of that and should encourage people to be active and have a voice. And if we do that, right, then that's the headline that we wanna see in the news. That's the great awakening. Um, in terms of a step, um, you know, all the steps that folks have lined up here as well. And also just like sort of fundamentally, if we're gonna shape, make the shift, or we're gonna shift the balance of, of society and the inequality, we actually need workers to come in and be organized as a force to shift that, to rebalance it, right? And it's a question of societal transformation, but it's also personal transformation. I feel like as organizers, as people who participate in a union or taking job action, you go through your, your own shift, right? And you find your voice. And I'm sure, you know, people, you know, out here can all feel that transformation when they found that they had a voice, right? Um, so if you're a worker, you know, join a union, get together with your coworkers in whatever form and make change. Um, if you're a supporter, what I would say is, you pick a worker organization, you know, um, Trabajadores Unidos is like fighting wage theft for Latinx restaurant workers in San Francisco. You know, whatever it is, do that and dedicate yourself to it the same way an organizer would, because that's what we need. We need that long haul. We need people to support that campaign. If you're excited about Amazon, you know, I'll drop in the chat. There's people who are calling out one of the board members to push them to negotiate right? There's tons of actions you can do, but whatever you do, like do that and commit to it, be dedicated and do it for the long haul. That's why I asked Kung to go last because I know as an organizer, he would have the mic drop moment. Um, so we're at time. I just want to um, express my deep gratitude uh, to Kung, Zima, Lisa, Katen, uh, for sharing your wisdom with us today. This has been really fun. Um, Brianna, thanks so much for your uh, tech support. And yeah, thank you all for joining us for this conversation. I hope that we get to uh, interact with you more and see your faces uh, sometime in the future. Uh, have a great day. Enjoy the rest of the event. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.